Hello, I would like to say a warm welcome to everyone. My name is Mary Spani. I'm the Academic Programs Coordinator at Columbia Global Centers Istanbul. Today, we're delighted to host our 12th webinar on reading, commenting, and interpreting as part of our program on Voices of Emerging Scholars, led by Professor Zeynep Çelik, Sakıp Sabancı Visiting Professor of Turkish Studies and Distinguished Professor Emerita, New Jersey Institute of Technology. So uh, we believe in the importance of creating ongoing scholarly conversations, and uh, we cannot wait to hear more about the research of our guest speakers today. I just want to remind you that we will have a Q&A session after the presentations, so please feel free to post your questions on the Q&A box. At this point, I don't want to take too much of your time, so let me leave the word uh, to Professor Celik. Uh, to introduce you to our panelists, our moderator, and today's program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Merve. Welcome to our 12th webinar. This translates to a year of monthly meetings. It has been a productive time, and we look forward to more work from emerging scholars. As always, my gratitude goes to my dear colleagues as at Columbia Istanbul Global Center. Ipek Cem Taha, the director, Merve Tezcanlı Ispahani, academic programs coordinator, and Sedan Gürlek, program officer, and to James Leitner for his generous sponsorship. I thank our participants. Nihal Soyuz, Aram Bugasyan, and Merisa Shahin for their fine research and intriguing arguments. We are most grateful to Professor Mehmet Fatih Ustu for accepting to be our discussant. His contribution truly expands the intellectual boundaries of our panels. Coming from literature, linguistics, and political thought, today's papers may not tightly connect with each other but they are all about reading, commenting, and interpreting, hence our title. In her analysis of the responses to Giritle Aziz Efendi's Muhayyelat, Nihan Soyuz raises provocative issues on literary modernity, translation, and interpretation. She makes us think about the importance of understanding the context in which these are produced. Aram Bugasyan brings a critical evaluation to the concept of hybridity attributed to Armeno-Turkish during the past decade or so. While I look forward to hearing Professor Uslu's take on this, I must ad admit I have my own reservations against the trendy term as it is used in my areas of scholarship. Melissa Shahin proposes to bring a new perspective to Ahmed Reza, who is widely acknowledged as a positivist. She highlights his critical approach to Eurocentrism and equates that with anti-colonialism, a striking argument that nevertheless needs to be reconsidered scrupulously. I'm thinking of Ahmed Rizad's very own words on the shortcomings of conquerors, the French conquerors, for not assimilating and enlightening Arabs in Algeria, and his advice to the French on how to achieve these goals. I can go on, but I better stop here. Nihal Soyuz is a doctoral candidate in comparative literature and a doctoral fellow at the Institute of Advanced Studies in the Humanities, both at Binghamton University. She received her MA in Turkish literature from Bilkent University in Ankara. She was awarded a Fulbright grant in 2017. Her dissertation examines the development and conceptualization of Ottoman Turkish literary modernity through a discussion of Muhayyelat 1796 by Giritli Aziz Efendi. She employs a world-oriented perspective and methodology. Aram Bugasyan is a doctoral candidate in Near Eastern Studies at Princeton University. His dissertation focuses on the impact of industrialization of print on Armenian language and culture in the mid-19th century. 
He earned his MA in Middle Eastern Studies from the University of Chicago in 2019 and bachelor's degrees in English and History from UCLA in 2016. His writing has appeared in Etudes Armaniennes Contemporaine and Los Angeles Review of Books Quarterly Journal, as well as in the New York Times. Melissa Shahid is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Political Science at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. She holds a BA in Political Science and Sociology from Boise University and an MA from New York University. Her interests lie in the fields of comparative political theory, postcolonial and critical theory, with a focus on late Ottoman political thought. Her current research examines Ahmed Reza Bey and the implications of his spin on Kantian positivism. Our discussant, Mehmet Fatih Uslu, is an assistant professor of comparative literature at Koch University. He is the author of Çatışma ve Müzakere, Osmanlı'da Ermenice ve Türkçe Dramatik Edebiyat, uh, Conflict and Negotiation, Armenian and Turkish Dramatic Literature in the Ottoman Empire, 2014. He is the co-editor of Tanzimat ve Edebiyat, Osmanlı İstanbul'unda Modern Edebi Kültür, Tanzimat and Literature, Modern Literary Culture in the Ottoman Istanbul. This is uh, co-edited with Fatih Artu and it was published in, again, 2014. He has translated numerous works of literature and humanities from Armenian, English, and Italian into uh, Turkish. So let me give the word to our first speaker, Nihan Soyuz here. Thank you, Professor Cherik, and uh, let me share my screen. Uh, so, uh, Muhayyalat, a 1796 collection of mystical and fantastic tales by Giritli Ali Aziz Efendi, is a title often mentioned in scholarship aiming to trace the beginnings of Turkish literary modernity before Tanzimat. Today, commonly considered a proto-novelistic narrative heralding some of the formal transformations of half a century later, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Muhayyalat was considered a somewhat objectionable and outdated work. As such, its reception and appraisal over the centuries have been intimately tied up with developing conceptualizations of literary modernity in the Ottoman Turkish context. In the following presentation, I will briefly introduce Aziz Efendi and his Muhayyalat, and then I will underline and discuss a few moments from the history of this text reception, which I believe embody these conceptualizations of literary modernity. Even as the value attributed to the text is revised, the modernity of the text is often as ascribed to its local color or partial realism and its original innovations to form and content in a way that overshadows its relationship to a dense network of texts that are the translations, adaptations, and pastiches of oriental tales following Antoine Galland's translation of the Thousand and One Nights into French in the early 18th century. I will briefly touch on the history of these translations as well and raise the question whether in the era of world literature we can say something new both about Muhayyalat and about literary modernity by regarding this text as part of a vast world of texts rather than a singular moment that is only meaningful in the context of Turkish literature. Um, Giritli Ali Aziz Efendi was an Ottoman official who was appointed the empire's first permanent emissary to Prussia in 1796. He died in Berlin in the fall of 1798. Muhayyalat, his best known work, was completed around 1796. It consists of three independent chapters, each of which is called a Hayal, titled Hayali Eval, and so on. Each Hayal consists of a frame story and several embedded tales. The stories contain many supernatural elements as well as religious, specifically Sufi themes and motifs, and, but they also contain multiple instances of realistic dialogue and descriptions of contemporary settings. According to Andreas Tietze's 1948 article, um, 
from among 20 or so tales, including the frame stories, included in Muhayyalat. Four are from Antoine Galland's translation of the Thousand and One Nights, and eight are from François Petit de Lacroix's Les Mille, Les Mille et en Jure, The Thousand and One Days, another collection of oriental tales that appeared shortly after the success of Galland's translation in 1710. Preserved in manuscript form for several decades after the author's death, Muhailat first appeared in print in 1852. Its subsequent popularity in the latter half of the 19th century is evidenced by several references Tanzimat era intellectuals made to the work. Muallim Naji uh, states his pseudonym Naji was inspired by the character Naji Billah in the third Hayal. Even though as a youth, he did not admire Muhayyalat because he considered it a mere collection of made up stories or mehumatan. Scottish Orientalist E.J.W. Gibb, who translated the second Hayal into English in 1888, asserts in his preface that the collection seems to have been made with the view of exalting the occult sciences as practiced by the dervishes and unfav unfavorably compares its language, which he views as outdated and bombastic to that of Tanzimat writers. Note how both commentators are concerned with the truth value of the stories and the supposed real life effects they have on real people and seem to believe these tales are meant to be taken literally. Implicitly in the case of Naji and explicitly in the case of Gibb, the falsehood or lack of realism in the text is associated with conformity to an older, less enlightened understanding of literature. Also noteworthy is the lack of any substantiated discussion of the text's relationship to the, to the Thousand and One Nights, in spite of Ahmed Nazif's recent translation of the Nights into Ottoman Turkish in 1842. Uh, this somewhat dismissive attitude carries on into the Republican period in Ahmed Tamdu Tampunar's uh, entry about the text in the Encyclopedia of Islam published by the Ministry of Education, in which Tampunar claims uh, Muhayyalat was written within the worldview and under the influence of old Oriental stories like The Thousand and One Nights and The Thousand and One Days. Particularly in the tales that constitute the first and second Hayals, this influence takes the form of a direct adaptation. Muhayyalat is nothing but an imitation of the old Oriental storytelling typically exemplified in Thousand and One Nights with all of its particularities and elements. Tampana then goes on to describe Muhayyalat as being at least a little bit original because of its formal and thematic structure and because of its lively depiction of everyday life in the 18th century Istanbul. Tampanar does not reflect on his identification of the text as an adaptation because he presupposes the category of a unified and stable oriental literature with the implicit assumption that Aziz Efendi was a natural member of this domain. The naming of the Thousand and One Days as one of the ultimate examples of this authentically oriental tradition is also interesting because it is simply wrong. Uh, the Thousand and One Days, um, and I'm going to go back to that. Um, the Thousand and One Days, from which uh, a majority of Aziz Efendi's tales are thought to originate, was an imaginative adaptation by the French Orientalist Francois Petit de la Croix, who reworked tales from a Turkish manuscript into a narrative he purposely modeled after Antoine Galland's translation of the Nights, even though he claimed this work was a straightforward translation of a single Persian manuscript. In fact, the modern Thousand and One Nights itself is less, straight, less a straightforward translation of a singular text than a patchwork of many different sources and influences, as it is well known today that Galan not only incorporated originally unrelated cycles and tales into the text, but he also completed his final few volumes with tales recounted by the Syrian Christian Hanna Diab. The image of the pure and complicated Orient as associated with these tales, which Tampanar seems to think Aziz Efendi complicates by transforming this tradition unsuccessfully. This is immediately proven an illusion in this instance. This somewhat dismissive view of Muhayyalat we have seen so far changes in the mid 20th century in favor of a notion of the work as a significant precursor to modern Turkish narrative. Andreas Titze's 1948 German language article, Aziz Efendi's Muhayyilat, can be said to have been the true genesis of this notion. Uh, 
And this 60 odd page essay, Tisa has two aims, which he does not link very closely together. First, ascertaining the exact sources of the tales contained in Muhayilat, and secondly, demonstrating that Muhayilat is an early example of a modern narrative in Turkish. Even though the larger part of the article is dedicated to the first of these goals, the latter position is also introduced early on as he asserts an equivalency between the modernization efforts under Selim III and what he terms the pre-Tanzimat pre westward turn, west orienteering of literature, and names Aziz Efendi, the man whom every historical account of Turkish modernity should begin with. Moving on, Tietze documents the sources of the tales, about half of which, as mentioned above, he claims come from specific French texts. Tietze also divides the tales into three groups, among which he clearly favors the set he describes as in the following. In terms of style, distinctly realistic efforts become noticeable. Local color, realistic dialogue. Political and social issues are touched upon. The templates are handled freely and sometimes skillfully altered. In this period, which comprises the best parts of Muhayilat, Aziz Efendi appears at his most modern in the sense of an appro approximation to the European conceptions of literature. For Tietze also, the text is at, is at its most modern when it distances itself from its models and gains specificity and originality. It is interesting how, while he ascribes Aziz Efendi with an approximation of European literary modernity, Tietze seems to attribute this approximation to Aziz's own sensibilities rather than any conscious decision to adapt a Western narrative despite his own lengthy documentation of Aziz Efendi's sources. Later scholarship on Muhayyalat continues to underline the formal and thematic characteristics of the text in arguments for, for its modernity while not engaging with its relationship to its sources. The word modern can have three meanings. One denotes belonging to, belonging to the historical era that we assume we are currently in, which is commonly considered to have its beginnings in the 16th century. The second denotes possessing characteristics that are thought to have originated in or to define this historical era. The final meaning denotes conforming to the moral, social, cultural, and aesthetic standards considered the most up-to-date or the most aspirational. Confusion arises uh, in scholarly debate just as in everyday rhetoric, because these three meanings are commonly conflated and because all of these definitions are subject to change and revision. In the case of Muhayyalat, two assumptions traceable all the way back to Tanzimat and briefly summarized above seem to underlie its reception. First, that its sources are typically oriental and therefore not particularly remarkable. And secondly, that the modernity of a work of literature is predicated on attributes such as originality, specificity, representativeness of a local slash cultural slash national context, which define, which all define an ideal of literary modernity that is often conceptualized as being inherently Western. Yet the first of these assumptions overlooks the complex modern history of the, of the adaptations and pastiches of the 2001 nights, which Muhayilat intentionally or un unintentionally participates in. The second assumption risks trapping a text inside the boundaries and periodizations of national literary historiographies and rendering its relationship to the literary world invisible. I propose viewing Muhayilat as modern, not just as an original work, but also as adaptation and placing it also in the modern history of the Thousand and One Nights, rather than just in the history of Elf Leyla. In practice, this means asking questions such as, what relationships does this text have with other texts it is not customarily grouped together with? Every text is a part of a dense multidimensional network of texts, which literary historical pre periodizations cut through by highlighting some relationships and cloaking others. In the case of Muhayyalat, its place in the linear progression of Turkish literary modernity is highlighted while its more or less lateral relationship to the aforementioned worldwide trends are often overlooked. Um, additional questions concern our engagement with concepts such as the Orient or an Oriental literature, the, authentic the authenticity of these concepts, 
and how and to what extent these are treated as the opposite of, moder opposite of modernity or contrarily to what extent and under which conditions they are incorporated into narratives of modernity. This question is particularly important in the context of Ottoman or Turkish literature, which implicitly and somewhat uneasily considers itself oriental to this day. So these are some of the questions I would like us to discuss. And um, thank you for your uh, attention and time. And uh, now I am leaving the floor to my colleague, Aram. Thank you, Nihan. Okay. So in the last decade or so, uh, as Dr. Trelik said, introducing my topic earlier, there's been a heightened interest in Armeno-Turkish or Turkish written in the Armenian alphabet. The Armeno-Turkish written tradition uh, comprised myriad genres in both manuscript and print and was a rich one lasting roughly six centuries or so. It existed alongside other forms like Karamanlıca, Turkish in the Greek script, Judeo-Arabic, Arabic and Hebrew script, and others in the Ottoman Empire. Over an even longer period, there are many examples of the Armenian script being used to write other languages like Kipchak, Greek, Arabic, Syriac, Kurdish, Georgian, and Latin, but Armeno-Turkish is the best studied and most culturally significant to them, at least for the early modern and modern periods. So as observers have pointed out since at least the mid 19th century, the Armenian alphabet rendered Turkish clearly with less ambiguity than the Arabic script. This was in fact what first attracted scholars, namely, American missionaries to Armeno-Turkish, given its potential as a tool for proselytizing among Turkophone Armenians. In the 20th century, academics writing in Armenian, Turkish, French, German, and English showed some interest in Armeno-Turkish as well, but this was for the most part sporadic and on the whole descriptive. Armeno-Turkish studies then picked up some steam in the early 2000s, and we can observe something of a boom in the last 10 years. What sets this newest academic literature apart from that which preceded it is a new vocabulary for talking about Armeno-Turkish. And this dominant paradigm is best condensed to one term, hybridity. This has become the most widely accepted way for understanding and contextualizing Armeno-Turkish cultural production to the point that it has become ubiquitous. The term hybrid is commonly deployed to describe Armeno-Turkish as a medium, the text written in it, and the people who used it. This is done primarily in reaction to nationalistic scholarship. The argument goes that Armenian and Turkish literary historiography are ill-equipped to account for the existence of Armeno-Turkish, unsure of whether to claim it for themselves or to reject it as foreign. The framework of hybridity is a supposed solution to this problem. Armeno-Turkish is neither solely Armenian nor solely Turkish, proponents of hybridity say, but occupies a space in between the two cultures. Armeno-Turkish thus becomes evidence of cross-cultural encounter or interaction, a meeting place between two cultures, or even in some cases between two worlds. These arguments are all well and good as correctives to past li Turkish literary historiography, which is largely silent on Armenian writers' role in the development of modern Turkish letters. But hybridity discourse, now dominant in Armenian and Armeno-Turkish studies, comes up against its own limitations, and that's what I want to primarily discuss today. So in a word, the scholarship of the 2010s has reproduced the errors of the past historiography, though in more subtle ways. By focusing on the supposed liminal space between Armenian and Turkish culture, the most recent iteration of Armeno-Turkish studies has left these categories intact. Hybridity and its associated key terms in between cross-cultural and so on, already imply the existence of defined cultural forms that overlap in an Armeno-Turkish textual space. The use of Armeno-Turkish by Armenians in this schema is sometimes described as appropriation, while Turkish is also referred to as their mother tongue. This contradiction, that one could appropriate or borrow from their own mother tongue, is not recognized as such, reifying again the fundamental separateness of Armenian and Turkish cultures. This gets to the heart of the issue with Armeno-Turkish studies fixation with hybridity as a sort of panacea to the older historiography. So Armeno-Turkish, I argue, does not actually constitute an in-between space. It's not, in other words, a place where Armenian and Turkish cultures overlap or meet. 
Rather, Armenophone and Turcophone cultures, at least in the late Ottoman literary world, already existed in a milieu where the boundaries between ostensibly separate cultures blurred to the point that speaking of them in isolation obscures a clearer understanding of that literary historical moment. Instead, it's more productive to think of Turkish as an Armenian language, similar to the way some Jewish study scholars do with the German language. This framework helps us think through and past the limitations of hybridity by foregrounding the Turkish language's role as an Ottoman lingua franca and not as a national language belonging to a particular group. Armeno Turkish is more intelligible as the product of Ottoman Armenians' engagement with the Turkish language, not as appropriators, but as equal participants in the production of modern Turkophone literary culture. That is to say, Armenian culture was not separate from or external to Turkish language and culture. So we see little evidence in the writing of in the writings of Armenian Turkish authors of what we might today call a discourse of cultural exchange in relation to the use of Turkish. This is probably because Turkish was so widespread among Armenians at the time, and uh, we could discuss this more in the Q and A if anyone's interested. We see instead the language of utility instead of this language of cultural exchange. Let's look uh, quickly at a few examples from the 18th and 19th centuries. First is the 1727 grammar of the vernacular Armenian of Sivas, written in Armenian Turkish by Abbot Mukhtar Sebastatsi. Mukhtar explains in his preface that he used Armenian Turkish to accommodate Turkish speakers who wished to learn Armenian. He was obliged, he writes, to use Turkish to reach these people. A second example, Patriarch Agop Nalyan also used Armenian Turkish in his writing, deeming it a useful means of communicating with lay readers. The book on the slide featured Armenian Turkish and Armenian sections. Uh, on the left, you have the title page, and on the right is the first page of one of its Armenian Turkish sections. We also have Mikhail Chamchan, one of the eminent historians of his time, who wrote in the Armenian Turkish version of his history of the Armenians that he deliberately chose to render Turkish words as they are pronounced by common people, halk in Turkish, for the benefit of readers as well as listeners. And finally, we have the writer and statesman Hopsep Partanya, who's notable as the author of the 1851 Armenian Turkish novel Akabi Yikayasi, which is the first novel written in Turkish. He discussed language choice in the preface to his Armenian Turkish history of Napoleon Bonaparte, seen here. So, addressing those who may have wondered why he didn't write in Armenian, Bartanya explained that classical Armenian was virtually known, uh, virtually unknown, excuse me, to most of the, the Milet and that there was not yet a suitable modern idiom for him to use without relying on the older classical form of Armenian. He was left with Armeno Turkish as the most reasonable option given the needs of his audience, according to him. This sort of linguistic dynamic comes up in the press as well. So here's a quick example. Some periodicals began as Armenian publications then shifted to Armeno Turkish or vice versa. I have one on the screen here, one such example. It also was common for Armenophone publications to print armeno turkish pieces in their otherwise Armenian issues. So historians and literary scholars may, of course, read hybridity into these sorts of practices, as indeed they have. And I don't, I don't think this is an unfair analysis, nor is it completely unfounded. And we don't need to act as stenographers and transcribe what the sources say without interpretation. That's part of our job, after all. But contorting this textual evidence to conform with an a priori conception of hybridity allows for the perpetuation of the older historiography's residuals by, as I was talking about earlier, as I explained earlier, presupposing the existence of separate Armenian and Turkish cultures. I want to emphasize that Armeno Turkish was a seamless part of the late Ottoman literary landscape. The use of Turkish among Ottoman Armenians, whether written or spoken, was an entirely quotidian practice and Armeno Turkish cultural production occupied the same world as Armenophone texts and those written in Turkish in the Arabic script. Armeno Turkish texts were constituent parts of a broader multilingual literary tapestry where readers and writers did not discriminate, at least not yet and not very intensely, between Armenian, Armeno Turkish, and Turkish writing in the Arabic script. In other words, there was no liminal space between Turkish and Armenian. There was but one space without clear boundaries. Uh, between supposedly coherent entities. Indeed, this cultural space developed under a common set of influences, and the literatures belonging to it came into their own at the same time and in the same place. 
Audiences shared similar tastes. Armenians read Turkish and Turkophones, Armenian or otherwise, read Armeno Turkish. Any Turkophone who could hear a text written aloud, uh, uh, read aloud, excuse me, in the home, coffee house, barbershop, marketplace, or the street had access to these works in one form or another. Some could read the Armenian script as well. Learning to read Armeno Turkish was not necessarily an arduous task for Turkish speakers. Opportunities to learn the alphabet weren't too difficult to come by, and there were a number of short, cheap pamphlets that could teach one to do so in no time at all. We have here two examples of such pamphlets, and on the left, an invitation uh, in a Turkish magazine inviting people to the magazine's printing office um, to come to be taught the Armenian alphabet. So it's difficult, if not impossible, to think of Armenian literature in the late Ottoman era without a consideration of its invocation with Turkish language and literature. Armeno Turkish as it existed in the world was not the special case or necessarily viewed by contemporaries as something distinct from other cultural forms. It was an, an unextraordinary fact rather of cultural life. Hybridity discourse has tried to transcend the Turkish Armenian binary by drawing attention to the spaces of overlap the two cultures shared. Thinking of Turkish as an Armenian language, I argue, explodes the binary altogether. Thank you. And I will now hand it over to Marisa. Uh, thank you so much, Aaron. Um, yeah, I don't have a PowerPoint, so I'm just going to talk for a bit um, about Ahmed Jazabe. Um, so the topic of my paper is how he merged positivism and some form of anti-colonialism. And he's, um, so Ahmed Jazabe was lived between 1858 and 1930 and is famous for being a statesman and an early leader of the Committee of Union and Progress, as well as a positivist thinker. And I think he's more so being studied as such, like a considerable amount in the literature focuses on either his scientific political thinking um, or his efforts in domestic politics for which he was exiled. So obviously this is a big part of his intellectual world. Um, in the late 19th century, he was exiled. He spent many years in Paris and then he came back to the Ottoman Empire after the 1908 revolution. And while in Paris, he ran the dissident newspaper Meshveret and joined social circles with the likes of Pierre Lafitte and Georges Clemenceau. So he was pretty attuned to the intellectual and political worlds of Paris, as well as the Ottoman Empire. Um, however, such close contact with the imperial core also produced an interesting light of thought in him, his anti-colonialism. Um, looking at both his, some of his stuff in Meshveret and his later book, um, I think Ahmed Rizal's thought was characterized by a sharp criticism of European colonialism and a critique of the capitalist world order as well. These things are very connected. Um, and he's often characterized as simply a positivist in Ottoman studies who merely studies, merely follows um, Auguste Comte and Pierre Lafitte, yet I think he was an original thinker who reimagined um, Comte and Lafitte's positivism in order to develop a critique of European imperialism. Um, and to construct some form of some form of anti-colonial solidarity. Sorry about that. Uh, so I mainly look at his book, uh, "The Moral Bankruptcy of Western Policy Towards the East." This book, my main source material for this presentation, was written in 1922 or published in 1922, when Ahmed Jazar was back in Paris after a decade in Ottoman politics. He was sent to Europe in 1919 for a semi-diplomatic mission to change European public opinion to the benefit of the Ottoman Empire. And he ended up staying until 1926. Um, and then he went back to Turkey in 1926 and died a few years later. Um, the renewed close contact with the imperial core cemented his anti-Westernism, which was already present, I think, in his writings in the 1890s and early 1900s in Meshvedet. So my source is thinking in this paper is mostly the book, but I wouldn't say there is a huge shift um, between his thinking on the matter. Um, and the arguments made are, in fact, I think very similar to the ones in his earlier op-ed. So in, to foreground the discussion, I will first summarize the political principles of positivism on an international level and then move on to Ahmed Rizal's intervention. So positivism, as it is widely recognized, denotes the doctrine founded by Auguste Comte, which is a systemization of thought, which extends scientific thinking to basically all realms of knowledge. Um, and this included 
obviously the sciences, but also morality and politics. According to Comte, the world had not yet been able to come up with a morality that would universally satisfy humanity because the moralities he sees around him were not scientific enough. Um, and this observation stems from his law of three stages. According to Comte, um, humans initially understood and explained the world in theological terms, which formed the first stage. So in this case, you know, the will of the gods are the reason for everything that happens. Um, in the second stage, theology evolves into some sort of metaphysical abstraction, uh, which Comte saw as the prevalent form in his time. And the third and the final stage represents the emancipation of humanity from theology and metaphysics and humans explaining things in terms of scientific truths and observation. If this stage were reached according to him and applied to all realms of life, it would create better lives and obviously better politics. However, not every place in the world was capable of this at the time and a considerable amount were still stuck in the second stage. And these places, according to Combs, needed a vanguard of humanity that would offer some assistance, um, an example on a voluntary basis um, for them to develop into scientific and critically minded societies. And this positivist guidance was attributed to the West and it was this part that Ahmed Jaza had qualms about. Um, I mean, even if the Comtean framework isn't necessarily directly colonial, I think it's very easy to see the connections between, um, you know, the vanguard and like enlightenment um, rhetoric. So Ahmed Reza observed that Europe was not as enlightened or ethical as Comte claimed it to be. Um, for him, it had no standing as a legitimate vanguard of humanity. Thus, he modified a key connection Comte and Lafit made uh, between the positivist method and European hegemony. He rejected their notion that a vanguard of humanity that was located in the West, um, and the West here is kind of different to Europe um, because it includes um, places like the United States or um, Australia, but doesn't include Russia, who it, which is technically in Europe. So this vanguard of humanity that's located in the West would ensure progress. And this meant a re-evaluation re of the role of the Ottoman Empire, which Comte and Nefit regarded as also a non-vanguard, um, and also the Muslim world at large within the world system itself. So in this sense, I think Ahmed Rizal's project was a more egalitarian one um, in terms of his vision for a world order. Um, his aim was to construct some altruism um, in which all nations would have a somewhat equal footing with the help of a shared positivist enlightenment as opposed to certain nations leading the way. And while Comte um, was not extremely essentialist about his um, vanguard role, like he argued that in the long term, non-vanguards could be able to be admitted to the West if and when they were ready and if they want to. Um, Ahmed Rizal disagreed with this formulation as well um, because for him, the point is not to have the vanguard status to expand to include formerly non-vanguard countries. Um, he wanted to abolish that hierarchy. Uh, if the West expanded, it would make every place look like itself, whereas for him, um, differences created progress. Um, and the majority of the world resembling one another was not a desirable outcome. In Moral Bankruptcy, um, his book, Ahmed Rizal seeks out to critique European morality and show that even if Europe had greater economic and political power compared to the rest of the world, it had failed morally. And he traces what he considers to be this decline of morality from the Crusades well into the age of high imperialism. While he remains attached to positivist principles at large, um, which meant you know, he agrees that more should be based on empirical observation um, and some extensions of that idea, um, Ahmed Reza rejects the Eurocentrism very much present in its Comtean iteration. Instead, he stresses the contributions of non-European civilizations on a, like a, in a huge chunk of this book, um, presenting the progress of humanity as one that is much more inclusive than rather simply spearheaded by the West. He argues that although Europe of the 19th and 20th centuries claims to be enlightened, nothing really can be further from the truth. Um, and for him, European foreign policy, primarily based on expansion and colonialism at the time, is motivated by what he calls medieval ideas and beliefs, which originate from the Trojan capitalism. Ahmed Rizal's qualm with Europe was then twofold. Um, firstly, it's not positivist enough, um, so led by Christianity. 
Um, and for, according to him, this had been going on for centuries, though it had slightly shifted recently when he's writing um, with the advent of capitalism. Um, in the past two centuries that he's looking at, you know, material interest becomes a much more significant motivator of European interventions all around the world. Um, however, it was strongly supplemented by the hate and vengeance that vengeance, sorry, that led the Crusaders. Um, Europeans were not, according to him, freed from theological or metaphysical sentiments, despite their claims to being enlightened, neutral, scientific. Um, and secondly, and very much related to this topic, the West took on a vanguard rule of which it was unworthy. Um, and he has a letter exchange with Pierre Lafitte about this. Um, that is actually very interesting. Um, so his view of Europe, I would say is generally negative though he does, it is a complex view because he also admires Europe in certain ways. Um, he fervently criticizes European imperialism, I think in this book, um, but he did have an admiration for Europe. Um, so he finds in his words, the barbarous politics of Europe heinous, um, but he does recognize the intellectual developments that took place in Europe, especially in the last couple of centuries in his writing. Um, in, um, he writes that an alternative Europe of free progressive ideas and peace does exist. Um, however, this version of Europe remains hidden under a plethora of um, imperialist, clerical and material interests, which are dominant in the thought world and politics of Europe. And concepts and ideas like freedom, equality, um, coming from various European political moments, such as the French Revolution, um, seem to be completely lost to him once one is in the colonies. And yeah, he says Europeans attack other countries for material gain, but this is framed in more a civilizational way, claiming the peoples in these places are either subhuman or uncivilized. By doing so, um, Europeans create the grounds to do as they please without resorting to the modern political ideas and rational principles they have to, or at least they claim to, follow in the metropole. Um, so he recognizes uh, the civilizing mission, I think, as an important strategy for colonialism. And he argues specifically that Muslims are framed as savages because they do not think like Europeans. Um, his argument instead is that the superiority of some nations and inferiority of others is in the moral sphere. Um, he attacks colonialism directly by criticizing the generation of wealth through the exploitation of others and claiming that the superiority of nations is not gained through military power or trickery. His definition of superiority is one that is moral and he places moral superiority firmly in the East. So the remedy he has for these problems with Europe is following the positivist footsteps of Comte and Lefitte to a degree, basing mores on the invincible force of facts and science as opposed to theolo theology or metaphysics. Um, for him, neither religion nor politics could form um, a good basis for morality, especially in their current forms, with current forms which are only good to cover up mercantilism. His grand project in writing his book about the moral bankruptcy in Europe was to devise a new world order, I would argue, as did Comte, through basing his idea of morality on science and facts. However, his plan deviated on a very fundamental level from that of Comte's in that he saw nations as, as somewhat equal. Um, the divisions he found was due to the divisions between Islam and like cultural um, or religious differences, not in terms of civilization as Comte would describe it. Um, and once these were not, you know, religion was not the base of morality and science replaced it, the world would have an altruistic world order um, that would bind humanity that was divided between um, East and West or colon colonizers and the colonized. So I would say his positivism was way more egalitarian um, that foresaw a fraternity of nations without the civilizing mission attached. Um, and although at the time decolonization was yet to come, um, like a fraternity of nations was kind of unforeseeable, um, especially in the earlier times that he was writing. Um, I think in the early 20th century, a lot of he and Ottoman positivists um, did not think of a universal positivist project as a distant utopia. Um, for instance, Japan's 1905 victory against Russia symbolized a triumph of you know, Eastern morality against the invincible Europe. Um, Ahmed Reza read this specific victory as a positivist one, writing that it was 
quote, the fruit of a principled, faithful, and highly intelligent organization based on a conception of human destinies that excluded holy, icon, holy icons and false sentimentalities, end quote. This victory symbolized that any people, if organized in a way that is intelligent enough, could carve a space in world politics for them and that the superiority of the West is not inevitable. Um, a more peaceful world order where all peoples have a right to some sort of self-determination was possible. And for him, it was possible to, through positivism. Um, so I would say in this sense, his efforts were not simply geared towards, you know, placing the Ottoman Empire amongst the greats. It was at hinting at a potentially emancipatory project for the oppressed peoples of the world. Um, thank you so much for listening. I now yield the floor to Mehmet Vakit for his comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all these great papers. Uh, they are really inspiring and I really enjoyed reading and listening to them. And I think all of them are asking crucial questions on Ottoman and Turkish literary and intellectual history. And, uh, and uh, thinking on these questions, I think it's, it's, it's important. And uh, I think it's not easy to find common themes and characteristics in these three papers. So I would like to start discussing them respectively without trying to construct and establish a common base for all three. Let me start with Nihan's paper. And I think her paper puts forward a very important question. And this question, I think it goes beyond the borders of Mohayalat. In general, I think there is a persistent tendency in the field, which does not that much care pre-modern or early modern texts place in the general network. Mohayalat is not uh, the only example for that. Uh, many different examples are coming to my mind from different centuries, like, like Kömürcüyan, Çelebi's, Hikayi, Faris ve Vena, Vena from the 17th century. Uh, which was translated into many different European languages. And I think it's an unknown and really curious word teacher phenomenon. And, you know, nobody knows the text. Or we can think of the circulation, modification, and transformation of Tifli Kailere. Another example is the rewritings of Halki Kailere, which had a large audience in the 19th century, especially in Istanbul, of course. And has been published in many different Ottoman languages, including Turkish, Armenian, and Greek. So we have never reflected on those texts as the products of an intertextual cultural world. So I think if we can do that, it would be a huge contribution. Uh, as a second point, uh, as we all know, we have a long discussion about the birth of Turkish novel or modern Turkish fiction in general. And there exists an interesting discussion chain in Turkish literary criticism if there was a full-fledged rupture or a gradual transformation with certain continuity. And the defenders of the second position tried to show how, how Halki Kailer and Meddai Kailer informed the early modern literary pieces in the 19th century. Uh, as the most famous example, uh, as Güzündino showed, uh, how Nam Kemal recreated famous Tifli hikayesi, Hanche Ali Hanım'ın hikaye garibesi in his Intiba, which was published in 1875, just two years after Şemsettin Sami's Taşıkı, Talat ve Fitnat, uh, which has been accepted as the first Turkish novel by mainstream Turkish literary histories. So Nihan's argument is also significant warning for this traditional approach, I think in a different way. Uh, here comes my first question. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how does her discovery uh, here and you know, other similar maybe discoveries change Turkish literary history, especially in terms of periodization? And secondly, I think I have a harder question. Uh, and I think Nian's paper shows once more that we should reflect more on Hayal as a concept. 
uh, we know that it was a deep rooted classical concept for Ottomans, but it also became an important modern literary criticism concept in the 19th century, especially in Nam Kemal's writings. And uh, what do you think, Nihan? Can we think of the concept as a bridge concept between classical and modern literature? Uh, I think this kind of a linkage, this kind of a possible linkage could support the argument in your paper. And okay. okay. I'm I um, Nihan, uh, answer. Do before. I do I answer immediately or yeah, actually, we will leave the answers to the end. So, uh, if you, you could move on your on to your comments with our uh, with Fatih Uslu and and Marisa Bahar, and then we will uh, take our turns, and uh, all the speakers will answer your questions. Okay. Then I I continue. Okay, and uh, I believe Aram's argument is also impressive and significant. Uh, but uh, I think uh, I think I also have a great opportunity to challenge him, uh, and uh, I understand his con concern completely. But unlike him, I believe that both arguments are working simultaneously. Uh, you know, here they don't exclude each other. We have examples of hybridity and cross-cultural encounters, I believe. And at the same time, we also can, uh, we can imagine Turkish as an Armenian language. For instance, Ahmet Mithat's famous novel, Felatun Beyberakim Efendi, after its publishing in Turkish in the Arabic script, serialized once more in Armenian Turkish. And only after that, he became a famous writer among Armenians. This simple transliteration opened a new, new opportunity of cultural encounter, I think. After he passed away, Mr. Kochunyan, uh, the publisher of Jamanak, uh, had a flattering editorial on Ahmed Mitat and explained how he influenced uh, the Armenian reading public. Uh, it was in uh, 1912. Uh, uh, he, he, he published his editorial. And we know Ahmed Mitat's fiction have been published in Garabet Panosian's Manzumei Efkar, Garabet Itujian's Masis, and Mateus Mamurian's Arevelian Mamul. Uh, but as far as I know, no other Ottoman intellectual had this kind of influence. Uh, my first question is that, what do you think about this asymmetry? Ottoman Armenian readers have not read Nami Kemal or Shemsettin Sami, whose literary and intellectual products, outputs were available in Ottoman Turkish for everyone, but not in Armenian Turkish. Of course, you know, Nami Kemal, Shemsettin Sami, and some others, they were all you know, important, significant intellectuals like Ahmed Mitat. And also, I think here we should think more on the struggle and the neg negotiation between Armenian and Armenian Turkish. Uh, many important Armenian intellectuals, especially in the half of the 19th century, were against Armenian Turkish and they supported its elimination. Uh, some of them criticized even the you know, usage of Turkish words in Armenian texts. And those were not only the you know, ultra nationalist ones. Focusing on your argument, uh, what do you think about then one's elimination of you know, her own language? Uh, yes, and those were the questions for Aram. Now it's Marisa's turn. And Marisa shows that Ahmed Reza's positivism is one of his well-known intellectual traits, but she also thinks that we should add an anti-colonialist anti dimension to that. Uh, I think that this, is, this, is a real, uh, this is a real contribution uh, to, the, to, the, to Ahmed Reza's figure. But uh, I have a question here. I, I, I, I, I you know, Fatih Altu has an article about Ottoman writers' attitude against Western colonialism in the 19th century. And he shows that Ottoman writers in general, when they talk about you know, important Western literary pieces like Chateaubriand's 
Atala or the laws of the laws of two Indian savages in the desert. Uh, they were inclined to identify with the colonizer, not the colonized. And first question, my first question, can you place, uh, can you contextualize Ahmed Reza's anti-colonialism into the general Ottoman intellectual context? Do you have any idea for that? And secondly, I was wondering the changes in Ahmed Reza's thinking. Lafayette, his book you discussed, came out in 1921 or 1922. And at that time, Ahmed Reza was in Paris and he was trying to drive support for the national movement led by Mustafa Kemal in Anatolia. And also the book came just after the World War. Uh, we know that he wrote and published the book in French. And I'm wondering, if his political position, which changed after the war, has to do with his anti-colonialist ideas in this book, okay? So maybe we need more contextualization to understand uh, his anti-colonialist attitude in this book. Uh, I think, uh, I, I, I, you know, I adopt that uh, it can be, you know, uh, uh, uh, transforming, it's changing political position uh, related to the, the changing story of Turkey. Yeah, thank you. These are my questions. Uh, and uh, the floor is, I think now, is Nihans. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your questions. They, they really gave me a lot to think about. Um, I don't know if I can do them justice, uh, but I will try. Um, so about periodizations, uh, my intention isn't exactly to completely dismantle uh, any conventional periodizations. I think periodizations, literary historical periodizations can have a few functions. Um, so they can be they are imposing a sort of organization upon the past, or they can be just an acknowledgement or uh, a repetition of, of how uh, the people in the past named their movements, their, their beliefs, um, etc. So I think, like, and, and I suppose the third, um, the third function is kind of educational. Um, you know, if, if you need to write a textbook about um, Turkish literary history, you have to like, as with any any big subject, you have to kind of put it into um, um, categories. Uh, you have to put it into chapters. So I, I feel like those all have their functions and I am not arguing against those functions because again, uh, in a way, um, so you brought up the, the point of rupture versus continuation. So in a way it's Tanzimat was a rupture because uh, the Tanzimat writers, Tanzimat intellectuals were adamant that it was a rupture or it, it, it was meant to be a rupture. Um, they, they did want to cut off from all the traditions, uh, especially literary traditions and you know, reforming the language, etc. cetera. Um, but at the same time, um, I, I want to draw attention to period, like the limitations of periodizations and the blind spots they, they can create, especially if we take them too, uh, too literally or if we take them as unchanging, unchangeable, or as I don't know, factual descriptions of, of, of the times. Um, um, so yeah, that's my that's my argument about uh, about the periodizations, I suppose. So um, we don't have to. So I think like both literary and historical studies, um, you know, Turkish and Ottoman studies are actually like have been taking steps towards questioning the periodizations in the in the past few decades. Maybe historical studies have been doing it a bit faster than, than literary studies. Um, uh, but I feel like there are residual uh, blind spots or, or assumptions that are made about this. And uh, so as, again, in a way, I don't want to, I don't want to give back Aziz Efendi his agency by taking it away from say, Nam Kemal. Uh, but at the same time, we don't have to take 
uh, what Namik Kemal said about his own literature at face value. Um, um, and um, so, and maybe taking these periodizations too literally or, or too unchanging as too um, static, uh, then you have this perception that, uh, and I mean, it, it goes, it, it almost goes unrecognized, unnoticed. Like everybody knows that, everybody who's ever written about Aziz Efendi knows that he was writing in the, in the period, like 70 years after Galan translated The Thousand and One Nights, and, and it was this huge worldwide phenomenon. Yet the interpretation of, of, of that fact is as if, it, it's not remarked upon as if, as if Aziz Efendi existed in, in as if he was writing in 1700 like um as if the galan's translation as if he was writing in a world where galan's translation wasn't it wasn't a thing um so that's that's my gripe with that so that's that sort of um linear that sort of linear description of turkish literary modernity uh might be useful in some contexts but in this context it's it's kind of blinds us to those connections or sometimes even very obvious connections that the, this text has with other texts and uh your your question about hayal was really yeah it really is a hard question um but i mean obviously you you would know more about me so you're one of the experts i think uh, but one of the interesting things about Tanzimat literature is, of course, it was like it emerged. Uh, you could we could say all of what we now con consider new Turkish literature emerged uh, when um, realism as a as a literary movement was at its peak and maybe even waning a little bit in Europe. And so, and realism as a concept seems to have been very important to, to uh, people like Damu Kemal and Ahmet Mithat. And um, that doesn't mean they actually copied whatever realism was in France. That's another thing. Uh, but uh, so as, as you would know, uh, they called the, the realist Hakiki Yun and they called romantics Hayali Yun. And that's, that's actually a very interesting um, very, um, in a way, interpretive naming. Uh, so how they kind of uh, crystallized that um, uh, that's uh, core in romanticism. That's all about you know imagination, inspiration. But they kind of uh, put this into this this very uh, short descriptive term, and. Uh, of course, Aziz Efendi himself was writing when Romanticism was at its peak, but that's and and folk tales like being uh, you know being inspired by folk tales and even being inspired by the Thousand and One Nights, you know that's that's one of the tenets <laughs> you could say of Romanticism, but that's also not remarked upon. But then there is this this other. Uh, this other aspect of Hayal in uh, after in the aftermath of Tanzimat, because um, so you know uh, Ahmet Mithat and Fatma Ali write Hayal ve Hakikat in eight in the eighteen nineties, I think. So and um, so Hayal becomes so Hayal that was associated with Romanticism or that is associated with Romanticism. It also becomes associated with the older literature and and specifically everything that is unreasonable about older literature. So Hayal signifies like um, romanticism, old literature and poetry and passions and lack of reason. And, and realism is, is associated with prose and, uh, and reason basically. Um, and these obviously these also these are also things that define the understanding of the modern novel because there is also this discourse uh, about how the novel as opposed to poetry and as opposed to traditional literatures is a, is a more realistic form uh, 
which is obviously that's that's the thing that has been revised it's in the 20th century we came to understand novel as not necessarily so realistic um all the time and um and then Hayal is, is getting also uh, kind of rediscovered. And I mean, that's a really, very important question. I don't know if, if I could, if I was able to, uh, if I was able to uh, do it justice, if I, if I was able to answer it uh, very well. But um, yeah, I think that there's definitely, um, there's definitely something to, to investigate in that conception of Hayal, both as the opposite of real, realism and reality, and as a, as a, as a literary concept in itself, or, or an intellectual concept in itself. And yeah, thank you so much. Okay, so I suppose I'll go next. Um, I'll answer the questions in order if I can, and please uh, intervene if I forgot to answer. So the first one was about um, sort of if the argument, if both arguments could be made, if we could say that Armenian Turkish is hybrid, and if we could think of it as, as at the same time as Turkish, uh, if we could think of Turkish as an Armenian language. So you pointed out that Ahmed Mithat's novel, Belatun Bebe Rakam Efendi, was transliterated into Armenian Turkish from the original Arabic script, and this made it more popular. Uh, that's certainly the case, I imagine, um, especially because I think, first of all, it's easier to read Armenian Turkish than it is Ottoman in the Arabic script, especially if one's already familiar in one form or another with the Armenian script. Uh, the same is, is true today for me, at least. Reading Armenian Turkish, I find easier than reading uh, Turkish in the Arabic script. But also, I would say that while that may, may have made it more popular, I wouldn't go so far as to say that Armenians didn't read Namak Kemal or Shemsin and Sami, because first of all, the history of reading is understudied in. Armenian studies and also in Ottoman studies. So it's hard to, I think it would be difficult to prove that they didn't read those authors. And also at the same time that Armenians could read Turkish and the Arabic script. We have evidence of that at least. So uh, for example, Armenian uh, students would learn to read Turkish in the Arabic script. There was, I came across this the other day, actually a catalog from the 1880s published by the Armenian Milat administration of textbooks used in schools, in the Milat schools. And um, the section for Turkish language textbooks, a lot of them are written in or teach students in Arabic script. One of them is Kitab Ja'arak El Tozlian's Talmikrat, which is massively popular. It teaches to read uh, Turkish in Arabic script. It was published something like three dozen times, I think. And also at the same time, I mentioned Garabet Panos and the very famous uh, newspaper publisher. He would also in his newspaper sometimes publish uh, Turkish articles in the Arabic script as well. So the assumption would be that the people who are reading his Armenian Turkish newspapers, which also featured Armenian from time to time, would be able to read uh, Turkish in the Arabic script. So I, while I agree that Armenian Turkish would probably be more popular among Armenians than Turkish in the Arabic script, I wouldn't go so far as to say as, uh, I, it's difficult to prove in other words that they wouldn't have read, uh, let's say works of fiction or other works in uh, Turkish in the Arabic script. Um, the second question was the sort of, um, the movement to purge Armenian of Turkish elements, is that correct? So uh, certainly many intellectuals during this time and sort of mid 19th century, what's called the Karabaykat, it's called that later, the, what's called the language question, the Armenian language question, called for the purification of Armenian of Turkish, of uh, foreign elements, but that mostly meant Turkish. Uh, even today, the Armenian language has many Turkish loanwords. Um, but I would also say that just because these intellectuals thought that ought to be the case didn't make it actually the case. Their prescriptions weren't necessarily followed. So there might be an intellectual current calling for the, the purging of Armenian of Turkish elements, but Turkish still persisted, I would say, as an Armenian language regardless. Um, so first of all, you'll see even into the 1910s or so, there are two accounts uh, after the 1909 Adana massacre, uh, thereby Zabal Yesayan and Arshagoui Teotik, who go down to Adana and are kind of surprised by how widespread knowledge of Turkish is among the Armenians in Adana and how, how poor their understanding of Armenian is. So that even though there's this intellectual current in the 1840s, 50s, 60s, 
uh, I think we could still talk about Turkish as an Armenian language as it existed on the ground. And also we could, um, when it comes to this sort of intellectual discourse, we have counter examples as well. Garabit Panos, again, to mention him, um, wrote that it was necessary for Armenians to emphasize Ottoman Turkish education or education in Ottoman Turkish in schools. Uh, he called it something, uh, I forget the, his actual words, but our state language he referred to it as. So again, I wouldn't say that that countercurrent is as strong as the one you mentioned for the purging of Turkish elements, but I would press the point that just because intellectuals thought that ought to be the case didn't make it actually the case. So I don't think it makes Turkish any less of an Armenian language. Um, and I hope that answered your questions. I think they were great questions. Thank you. It, it was good to think about these things. Um, I guess it's me now. Thank you so much for the questions. Um, for the first one, I recently read the Fatih Alto article and it was very interesting for me because I'm not a literature person, so it's not like something I know very well. Um, and it's not a period that I know that well because I study a sort of like a couple decades later. Um, but I was really struck by, yeah, it, it, it was, you know, at worst really identifying with the colonizer, at best really taking it uncritically as like a source on, say, with Chateaubriand's Atala, like a, you know, a very accurate source for Rejai um, Ekran, for instance, about Native Americans, which like is clearly from a very colonial lens and like I would maybe expect a bit more um, criticism, like a critical lens from him. Um, but what I found interesting and in, uh, there was like at, at the end, he talks about Mizan Murat, which is like a shift. And I think he's more of a contemporary with Ahmed Reza. Um, and I think that's something interesting to think about because um, all of the other authors that he's referring to are writing in like an earlier time, um, both within the 19th century, but then Ahmed Reza and then Mizan Murat and then like some other young Turks too. Like this is, I think something that people talked about a lot and I'm not sure how that shift happened, but there's a lot of discourse while Ahmed Reza is writing with all the other Parisian Turks. Um, even somebody like Prince Sabahattin, who was semi-pro-intervention at the very end um, about um, colonialism and how this is um, unethical on the part of Europeans. Um, and yeah, I think the 1902 Parisian Congress of Ottoman dissidents is like a very interesting place to look at this. Um, because obviously there's two camps of Ahmed Reza and Prince Sabahattin, but um, Ahmed Reza is like the very anti-intervention one and Prince Sabahattin is like, it's inevitable and there's not a lot that we can do about it, so might as well. Um, but I think like, if I were to speculate a little, um, maybe, um, so I guess they really felt the threat of um, just Europe really coming in and intervening and really screwing up the empire maybe in a way that is not so much the case in earlier times. Um, hence, um, it, it, I don't know, it's just like you see more of a critical lens in a later, um, late 19th century, early 20th century, um, you know, intellectuals. And I also do think it's like, it has a lot to do with um, how much they were really included, like not included is not a right word, but how much time they spent at the imperial court itself, because, um, you know, Ahmed Reza, just like a ton of his writing actually happens in Paris. Um, and he's very attuned, like in a way he's very cosmopolitan. He has, you know, he socializes with a lot of like Parisian intellectuals as well as intellectuals from all over the world um, in Paris. Um, and they're all there because it is the Imperial Corps. Um, and, you know, it created a, more critical lens for him than maybe what he would have had he spent his entire life um, on the so-called periphery. Um, and I think that kind of speaks to the second question as well. I feel like they were a little related, especially in terms of like how I think about it, because he is um, in his op-eds in Meshret, he's very critical of Europe, um, if not like this blatantly anti-colonial. Um, there's a lot of European criticism, even in um, like, I guess like he writes in French and in Turkish and there's there might be some difference between like how he writes for different audiences. Um, but even in the French ones, there are like criticisms to, to European policies. And I think that goes for a lot of young Turks who publish um, in, in French at the time and not specifically in um, Turkish journals either. And also like a lot of, you know, um, 
local, I mean, not local, but like national French journals or English journals. Um, so I think the sentiment was very much there. Um, I, and his writing the book in the 20s is I think also very much a product of, you know, him being trying to, uh, so he goes to, um, Europe in 1919, his second time around. Um, and he's there until 1926. And a lot of things shift at the time um, regarding the status of the Ottoman Empire, it becomes Turkey, um, it's a whole thing. And what he's trying to do is to create a like better public opinion. And there's a lot of like, I don't know, historical work on, um, not a ton, but um, on his impressions on this. And like eventually comes away with the idea that like they really do not care um, about us or like about the Ottoman Empire. Um, and I'm sure like, yeah, that, there, that has like some influence on like how anti-colonial he turned out to be because, um, he attends many conferences and, um, yeah, I think it's argued that he was instrumental in, um, how, uh, Turkey found us like modern Turkey or the Ottoman Empire at the time found, some, carved some sort of space in its, for itself, um, in world politics, but, um, a lot of like, I think historical research indicates that it was a struggle and um, he wasn't really seen that much as an equal. Um, so I think definitely that has, um, I mean, that probably has some effect on like his of becoming like much more anti-colonial. Um, but I think he was like throughout um, his um, like, since we can track it um, in the 1890s, he has a lot of criticisms against Europe, maybe not as much, you know, articulated in an anti-colonial way um, as it was in the book. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you uh, for all uh, great papers and presentations and also uh, comments and questions, uh, Professor Uslu. Uh, so, uh, so maybe we can start with one question that I have in mind, Nihan. I'm curious to know more about Aziz Efendi, um, his career, because I think he, he was in Berlin for some time um, as a diplomat, so he has a diplomatic career. The reason I'm asking is like, I'm curious to know about his own literary um, universe. So what books was he reading, the authors, and also a little bit about his self-perception. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's a very important question. And it's also kind of difficult to answer. So uh, he, uh, there isn't an abundance of, of information about his life. He was, uh, so he was born in Crete. He was a, so there's the story about how he squandered his, his father's wealth. Um, he was the, uh, he was the son of the deaf Tardar of Crete. And then uh, after squandering his wealth, he moved to Istanbul. Uh, he became an Ottoman bureaucrat and uh, he was sent to, he arrived in Berlin in 1797 and in fact died there. And so that was the last uh, one and a half years of his life. Um, so the other work he left behind is, um, the, that's, that's pretty much what you might expect from a, an Ottoman statesman. So he had a divan, uh, he had, and, and he was a very religious person from what we understand. So he was, uh, a uh, Sufi, uh, he had a sheikh, um, uh, he wrote poetry, he wrote Validat, um, he, had a, he has a Validat. Um, uh, but at the same time, uh, so after, after he arrives in Berlin, and we know that like, before arriving in, in European um, uh, b before arriving in European capitals for, for these missions, uh, these uh, emissaries were expected to uh, actually be um, uh, familiar with European culture or, or uh, European literature and um, more culture than literature, I suppose. And uh, in, in Berlin, he had a correspondence with uh, Friedrich von Dietz, uh, the German Orientalist. And... Um, at some point, so 
at some point, apparently, um, the uh, von Dietz was asking uh, Aziz about uh, some translations of, of Ottoman, and Aziz, uh, then after a while, it turns into a discussion of philosophical concepts. Uh, we get that Dietz wants to find out, like, you know, what Ottomans think about these things. And uh, apparently, Aziz writes uh, back in, in Greek, but has it translated to French and sent it that way and asks, and asks Dietz uh, whether uh, he can, he, he should publish his treatise. And, and Dietz says something about, you know, um, the, the translation is bad, the Dietz, von Dietz kind of dismisses him. And so I thought that was, uh, that's a very interesting anecdote because first we understand that Aziz spoke Greek, um, and was able to write to some extent in Greek. And also he was actually interested in, inter interested in publishing, uh, interested in being heard in this, in this European sphere. And uh, so I think I see that's, that's the thing. I think that shows um, some sort of connection with this, with this world that, that again should be obvious because he was already physically there. You know, he was uh, he was a diplomat. He was uh, assigned this duty to uh, communicate uh, in 21st century terms, kind of you know, um, facilitate intercultural exchanges in a way. Uh, but um, that's kind of that's kind of dismissed both by his his later readers and by von Dietz. Like um, so, that that attempt at communicating. Uh, is kind of dismissed. And um, other than that, um, what I can say would be mostly conjecture. So we know he attended opera, for example, and that was like a regular thing that they did. And there are some, some parts in, in Mohayalat where you can see that there is, um, um, he, he, can, he can be said to have been influenced by the magic flute for example, which was again um, the Mozart opera, and which was again also a trend in Europe, in European literature. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if I've been able to answer your question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Um, I don't think we have a question uh, from our audience. Um, but I'm also curious to know, um, maybe this can be for Marisa, but Professor Uslo mentioned about this a little bit as well. I mean, not a little bit, but you, you, you, this was one of your questions, but to what extent, um, I'm curious to know that, you know, your reading of Ahmed Zabe is a kind of, um, um, you know, is in relationship, because there's this whole body of um, scholarship on Ottoman Orientalism. So there, you know, you see this typical, uh, you know, um, statesman, Ottoman intellectuals, kind of internalizing that colonizing uh, discourse of Europe, and then, you know, seeing uh, the Ottoman other, like the, you know, uh, Arab provinces living in, they, you know, an, a state of uh, quote unquote nomadism and savagery. So we have this, you know, whole body of literature. So could you contextualize um, your research uh, within that body of literature? Because um, I'm kind of curious to know whether he is an exception uh, for his time or, you know, his views on positivism and everything, or is it kind of like he was very much a man of his time? So I'm I'm kind of uh, curious to know what your take is on, on this uh, specific question. Thank you. Yeah, of course, thank you. Um, that's a great question. And that is something I grapple with a lot in um, my um, dissertation. Um, I would say like off the top of my hand, head, um, he's, um, he's kind of both. Um, because I'm trying to think about like, um, I, I, I'm really interested in empire as a category um, in like the more political theoretical sense. Um, and obviously, like, I think usually um, in like the political theory literature of empire, the distinctions are incredibly clear. Um, 
like there's a colonizer, there's a colonized, it's usually West and the rest. And then they don't really go into um, other empires that much that are not Britain um, and France and Germany or like non-European empires who were still intact. So like the Ottoman Empire is a weird case there. Like the Russian Empire is kind of like out of, they're not very categorizable by um, that empire category. So, and I think that that literature, yeah, the um, um, that article that you were just talking about definitely like complicates the distinctions and I have looked into them. Um, I am trying to think through like how, um, so what the research I did on Ahmed Reza was basically what he wrote um, in Paris um, and in terms of like anti-Europe. So I haven't gotten there yet um, in terms of like what he was thinking um, about like the internal goings on of, um, of the Ottoman Empire. Um, there are like some bits and pieces that I could be of interest, I feel like in this case, like, um, so their big fight with, uh, you know, obviously like the dissident activities like against Abdul Hamid and there's like some visions of um, how to think about the Ottoman Empire. How could we make this a more like modern empire or um, a more modern country um, in a way. And um, one of the big discussions within um, that uh, discourse is whether it's like, you know, gonna be an Ottomanist centralized um, type of place or like the more Prince of Ahad thin line, which is like more local governments um, and much more like, you know, the power being a bit more dispersed. Um, and I would say Ahmed Reza is on the first camp of this. Um, and uh, he does envision like, you know, a, a semi more democratic, I guess, Ottoman Empire. But again, it's not something that I know at this point very well. Um, I think one interesting thing about him is, um, I think he was very much a man of the late 1890s in that I, he believed a lot in Ottomanism and he was very, very skeptical of nationalism. Um, and sort of like nationalism of ethnicities, but also, um, you know, like dominant nationalisms, which is a deviation from like later anti-colonialisms because anti-colonialism and national, like nationalism is usually treated as an emancipatory, emancipatory force um, in like, if you look at like the fifties and the sixties. So it's like before that, um, and obviously this has some pragmatic concerns in that like he's um, a, a Turkish intellectual from um, the center of the Ottoman Empire. So um, he has something at stake to like keep that empire intact and he's not, you know, um, he's one of the dominant group. Um, and obviously I think that like clearly just like plays into his view of nationalism is bad. It is a destructive force. Um, we should, you know, it's more like it's smarter to be Ottomanist. And then part like that is part of why he gets really sidelined in um, Ottoman slash Turkish politics later on because um, the nationalists kind of kind of take over. Um, and his more, um, I don't know, like I, I was gonna say liberal, but it's not exactly that. Um, his more non-nationalist way of thinking about um, self-determination um, became a very outdated idea um, starting from the 20s. Um, because the nation state became like a very, very, um, it's the dominant form. Like at that point, it became unimaginable to think like self-determination not tied to a nation state. Um, so yeah, um, he is, I would say he is in terms of like trying to be a bit more imperial and like kind of like cosmopolitan in a way and anti-nationalist. He's a man of his time, but he did get like, he didn't catch up with the times as, you know, within the 20 years of his like coming back from Paris. Um, and yeah, it, it is something like the, you know, Ottoman Orientalism or internal colonialism. I think there's a lot of like um, term terminology for that. Um, it is something that I am thinking about but not necessarily fleshed out yet. So I hope this was helpful. <laughs> I have a question actually, it's, um coming from my historian's background, I guess. I'm very um, curious about uh, Ahmed Reza's play in Paris. 
And I think there's a lot of anti-colonialism going on there as he is writing. And I'm wondering if it would be useful to you, Mary, so to look into that seriously. Now, 1907, what happened in Paris in 1907? There was a huge colonial exposition. And that exposition was later in Zoomen, as it was called. People were brought here. A lot of reaction happened to the way uh, the um, colonial subjects were represented there. And I'm wondering if living there, not so far from where the exposition happened, Ahmed Rizal, they just sat there and watched it and did not have any thoughts. What I'm trying to say, you don't have to answer me right now, but I think it would help you tremendously to break through the categories of your discipline, which are very rigid, it seems to me, and go through to, to a more interdisciplinary research and dig a little bit more into the historic specificities of this man's uh, context. Just an observation, but these are disciplinary dif differences. No, absolutely. Um, that is something I actually I plan to do this summer. It's just, I haven't, like, I couldn't go into really any archives outside of the United States. Um, and there's not a ton, like, where I am. Um, so I had to rely on, like textual stuff, just like not um, the stuff he wrote. Um, and that's not even a ton because everything shut down. And like, I am planning to contextualize this more um, in my field work, like this summer and next year. But yeah, um, thank you. It's like, it is helpful. Thank you. Um, any other comments or questions? If not, I think we can conclude now. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for these uh, great presentations and uh, also to our audience for joining us today. And uh, we will also post a, a video of, of this uh, session on YouTube. Uh, so for those uh, who missed this can watch it on, on YouTube as well. Thank you very much again. <laughs>